Good evening, everyone. I, Sneha Si, interning at the Nature's Eye organization, welcome you all to our Wildlife, Crime, and Forensics webinar. Before we proceed further, I would like you to introduce you all to my team members present here. Anukruti, Gaurav Jain, Grace Matthew, Disha Gupta, Dia Banerjee, and the core team. The Nature's Eye, powered by Wildlife Arc, is a group of nature enthusiasts who wish to share their knowledge and experience with the world. They strive to bring informative and educational content from the tiny living world to the city dwellers. Their motto is to empower environmentalists everywhere, which aims to create opportunities for budding environmentalists, people related to this field, and also to the ones who want to join it in a new through their various offline and online programs. This webinar is one such attempt within the training and internship program, which we are a part of. There are a number of such events in the line as well. We would like to inform you that we'll be conducting a two-day workshop on wildlife crime and forensics on 23rd and 24th June, and a filmmaking expedition in the month of June, July, and August, about which further information will be shared by the end of the session. So stay tuned to know more. Participants, who stay till the end of the session have, uh, will have a timestamp of minimum 45 minutes and will be distributed with e-certificates. And also they will get to know more about our exclusive discounts for the upcoming event. Now coming to today's event, Ms. Samyukta Ma'am is a postgraduate in forensic science from Amity University, Noida. She has over 10 years of experience in designing organizing and delivering training programs for diverse audience from across government, corporate and education sectors in India. She has worked on several successful campaigns for policy change at both national and international levels, which have impacted the welfare and illegal trade of wildlife, such as the anti shark finning campaign and the sites appendix one listing of pangolins. As part of the wildlife law enforcement training team at the Wildlife Conservation uh, Trust, Ms. Samyukta Ma'am leads the forensic capacity building work for various stakeholders that is a part of the organization's effort to combat wildlife crime. Now, without any further delay, I request all the participants to keep themselves muted throughout the session. And if you have any queries, please type it down in the chat box. We will take up all these questions in the last 10 minutes at the end of today's session. Thank you once again and over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you're not audible. I think you've muted yourself. Okay, okay. Sorry, my computer did what computers do best. Did a little jump into some other window. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this session. Um, firstly, a great occasion to be having this session since today is the World Environment Day, uh, celebrated across the globe uh, to commemorate uh, efforts made by several individuals to safeguard wild spaces and, of course, to identify the importance of uh, the environment in our daily lives. Uh, I know that when I was doing uh, school, we all had subjects on the environment that we all took so lightly because you were like, hi, yaar, ye, matlab, passing marks mil jayin, bas bahut hai. or, you know, it's just a fun subject, don't have to study anything at all. So we just took it lightly. But as I've grown in my profession, I've come to understand that uh, any and everything that we do in our daily lives is linked to the environment, be it business, be it waking up in the morning and breathing a gulp of fresh air, having a fresh glass of water to have, having good food on my table, having decent clothes to wear, having a roof over my head. Everything is linked in some intricate way to the environment and the same holds true for everybody living on this planet. Right. So uh, my aim today is going to be uh, to talk briefly to just introduce all of you who have participated in this webinar to the um, topic, which is wildlife crime and wildlife forensics. And we're hoping to treat this like a little teaser curtain raiser for the workshop that's going to happen later in the month. Uh, with, while, before I go forward, can I request all of you to turn on your cameras because when I train, when I teach, I do interactive sessions. You don't need to have your mics on right now, but I love to see faces. Uh, the pandemic has made us talk to screens and names and waves and memes and things, but I'd like to see faces. Even if you're in your pajamas, that's totally fine. It's a Sunday evening, completely acceptable. 
All right. Lovely. Nice to see faces. Before we go forward, couple of basic things. Uh, this is just a very, very, very basic introduction. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the depth and details of everything. So please don't think of what we discussed today as the be all and end all of everything that we will do in the workshop. There's a lot more we'll cover ground on there. Um, this is just to get your brains thinking about what is wildlife crime and you know why is it important for you, whether as a common man, whether as a professional, whether as somebody who's interested to work in this space to understand this better. Yeah. Having said that, I'm going to do this as an extremely interactive session. So it's important that all of you are paying attention. And uh, you know, from time to time, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourselves and talk about things that I'm gonna show you on the screen because this is not a one-way conversation. Unfortunately, the animals we work for don't have mouths, but the rest of us need to interact and speak with each other so we can do better for them. All right, so with that note, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Give me a minute. <clears throat> Okay, uh, can you all see my screen? Just nod yes. your heads if that's yeah, all right, great, super. All right, uh, just to give you uh, Sneha and uh, everybody else, thank you firstly for having me for this session. Uh, I'm very grateful for Smita ma'am and the several other people at St. Xavier's who I worked for several years for recommending me to do this. I'm always happy to interact with new audiences. Uh, any and all questions you have, I will keep, well, let's keep them for the afterwards. Uh, Time is not the limit here. We can sit till however long all of you want to chat and discuss. I know it's a Sunday evening, but time is not an issue. So, um, but I will aim to wrap everything up, uh, my session within 40 minutes and then keep it completely open for about 20 minutes for Q&A or more if need be, right? So with that, let's jump right in. Um, so the reason why we firstly talk about wildlife crime in India specifically, right? So very often when we read the newspaper, I don't know how many of you read recently the news about kangaroos that showed up in West Bengal, right? Kangaroos are not native species yes. in this country, but there were uh, kangaroos that showed up in West Bengal, in the state of West Bengal. Just like that, on a daily basis, there are animals that don't belong to India that are being brought into India for several reasons. Right, And one of the leading factors for that is the illegal wildlife trade, which is a smaller part of the larger umbrella of wildlife crime. Okay, Now, why is wildlife crime a cause for concern? India is one of the most uh, biodiverse, rich nations in the world. Right, We have tremendous biodiversity all across the country. So no matter which state you reside in, which city you live in, wherever you're located, you will be nearby somewhere geographically, forest-wise, wild space-wise, that has tremendous amounts of wild animals, wild plants, wild spaces, all right? Now, these animals are found all across the country. So some states have animals that, say for example, tigers. Tigers are found in multitudes of states across the country. But then there are also certain species that are found only in certain countries. For example, if you all have seen this uh, uh, movie Pushpa, right, which is about the trade in red sandalwood, that species is endemic to, to Telangana and Andhra. But the trade happens internationally and all other states act, act as transit routes for this particular species to be taken out of the country. Okay, so similarly, there are innumerable species found across this country, all of which have some form of demand in wildlife crime or wildlife trade. Now, why is this demand present, right? You may ask, I mean, it's a wild animal. What, what should I have to do with any of this? Okay, so it could be things, uh, somebody's drawing on the screen. Okay, it could be things like um, somebody wants to keep a pet animal at home. They've heard that, oh, you know, having a tortoise will bring money into your home, feng shui or vastu. So they bring turtles into their home. Somebody is fascinated by the thought that having an African gray parrot or some kind of chidia that comes in the wild in their home to sing songs to them every morning when they wake up, they want to have this animal in their home. There's also black magic beliefs, especially around Diwali. Owls are sacrificed in the thousands because people believe that the goddess Lakshmi is appeased by that. Okay, It could be pharmaceutical use. Several wild animals are used in the development of medicines that you and I consume on a regular basis. It could be for industry, it could be for, uh, for cosmetics, it could be for construction, it could be for developing some new nanoparticle that mankind is going to benefit with. 
right? So no matter whether you are the direct consumer of that wild animal, either as a pet keeper or the consumer of a product that is made by or through or from a wild animal, each of us is involved in wildlife crime, some which way or the other. Okay. Now the critical thing to understand is why and how does forensics play a role in helping curb this wildlife crime? Okay. To take a step back and talk about biodiversity, there are several biodiversity hotspots in this country, which means what? Which means that several of these areas, like the Western Ghats, which is uh, Maharashtra is a part of the Western Ghats, has endemic populations of wild animals and wild plants that are found nowhere else in the world and in rich quantities, which makes them extremely soft targets for poachers and criminals who are interested in poaching these animals, picking up these wild plants and trading them either within India or internationally for large volumes of money, right? So that's the uh, larger picture of why wildlife crime and wildlife trade exists. Now, if you think about the reason why this crime doesn't get tackled, right? So every day we read about police has caught so-and-so rapist, police has caught so-and-so gangster, police caught your neighbor because they were driving without a helmet on, or the police picked up somebody who was uh, in a drug bust, right? So we read about these actions by the police on a regular basis. But why do we not read about actions against wildlife criminals? There are several reasons for this. And the leading amongst them is the fact that wildlife crime today is considered to be a $23 billion industry internationally, which means that people who participate in this crime every year annually across the world, $23 billion are generated from the illegal trade of wildlife. Now, where does this money go? Large volumes of this money has today been proven to be used in other organized crimes which are the three main organized crimes in the world, drugs, arms, and human trafficking, making wildlife trade the fourth largest organized crime in the world. Reports today from leading organizations like the UN Office on Drugs and Crime suggest that not only are the money from illegal wildlife trade and wildlife crime supporting these larger crimes, they're also supporting terrorism. And also the same groups that are involved in these large organized crimes are the same people and the subsets of them are engaged in illegal wildlife trade. Now, these are large things of concern. So any and all action that we take against illegal wildlife crime, against illegal wildlife trade, any kind of action against wildlife not only impacts wildlife, not only benefits wildlife, but also benefits humans that are suffering from or victims of these larger crimes that I just spoke about. Right, so it's very important for the country, not only our country, but all countries across the world to develop capacities within their various officers to tackle wildlife crime and to detect wildlife crime, report wildlife crime and legally prosecute wildlife criminals. Now, a large part of that legal prosecution of wildlife criminals is where forensic steps in, right? Um, so as many of you may know, in India, we follow the principle that nobody is guilty until proven so. Right? Anyone is considered innocent until proven guilty, which is why whenever a crime of any kind, whether it's a wildlife crime, whether it's crime against another human, whether it's a crime against someone's property, someone's vehicle, someone's wife, someone's daughter, someone's animal, all of it has to be proved in a court of law. Now, the way wildlife crime is investigated is two ways. One, either directly an incident of wildlife crime will be reported to a forest officer or uh, incident of wildlife crime will come to the notice of another agency like the police or the DRI or the customs or the BSF or the uh, SSB, such as the uh, uh, Seema Bal, which take care of our borders or any other such agency. They take on a case and then hand it over to the forest department. The forest department will then build a case by investigating the matter, collecting evidence of various kinds and presenting it in a court of law. Now, why are these codes? Every state has a code. Now, wildlife is a concurrent subject, which means there is a central act and there are state level acts. So judges at state level are required to ensure that they take action or they listen to cases against wildlife criminals. Evidence is presented by lawyers and depending on the judgment the and the situation at hand, the criminal receives a sentence or doesn't. So this is where forensics feeds in is helping and enabling this trial especially by forest officers and other enforcement agencies to prove that XYZ person has committed a crime against XYZ animal. Now, in order to do this, they have certain 
uh, laws available at hand, which I will come to. But before that, I want each of you to understand visually the gravity of wildlife crime. Okay. So uh, the first little exercise for today, what do you see on your screens? You can unmute yourself and tell me what you see. Animals and their parts. Animals and their parts. Okay. Where is it? What is this location? What What does it seem like? Maybe China. a museum. Maybe a museum, Mitali. China, I think in the China. Or... China. I love how you make China the bad boy every time. Hmm? The ganda bacha of wildlife crime. Favorite, <laughs> favorite perpetrator every time is China. Kabi Chinese se mile nahi hai, but China is our favorite bashing person. Huh? Okay, all right, no problem. This is media washing at its best. Okay, what else? There are comments coming up. Guys, don't send chat comments. Unmute yourselves and speak. Vanita Sharma says, uh, taxidermy shop. Okay. Everybody, cameras on, mics off. Mics on when I ask questions, please. Any other thoughts? Uh, somebody said museum. Yeah, I said. Who said? Disha. Disha. Disha? Uh, yes, yes. I, I show us your beautiful face. Okay, great. All right. Great. So, well, you're not very far from the truth, Disha, in that this is actually uh, the uh, collection room, one of the many collection rooms of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Forensics Lab, which is the only dedicated wildlife lab in the country, in the world, sorry. And this is just one small room in the entire lab where contraband, which means illegally traded items made of wildlife are stashed away and kept while casework is happening on them, right? So this is one small room. So you can imagine how many such samples come into this lab on a regular basis. And this is one lab in the world. If you were to look at the forensic labs that exist in this country, you would probably see this multiply 20 fold and only perhaps a handful of labs in our country that can actually deal with this. So this is an issue I'll talk about a little bit later, but just for you to understand the scale of the problem. Okay. Now, um, what do we see here? Packed animal keeping monkey as a pack. Rubbish, you're seeing Justin Bieber. Don't lie. Yes, Justin Bieber with his pet monkey. With his pet monkey. Okay. I love how everyone's shying away from recognizing Justin Bieber. Very nice. Okay. So, Justin Bieber with his pet monkey. Okay. Now, tell me something. If you saw Justin Bieber, or not Justin Bieber, say any celebrity with something that you didn't know was illegal. Say, for example, Justin Bieber is sitting with this monkey, right? Now, how many of you think this constitutes a crime? Um, yes. Yes. It's a, no. crime. it's a crime, Mitali says. Okay. Yes. Even though it's Justin Bieber doing it and we have our hearts set for Justin Bieber. Yeah. Maybe yeah. if they have permissions, I can comment Maybe on if that. They have permissions, very interesting. Going in the right direction. Okay. Anybody else? Everyone else is quiet. Okay. All right. Now. This is Justin Bieber, Mr. Justin Bieber, world famous singer, sitting with an animal that is a capuchin monkey, which is extremely endangered in the wild, right? Now, if you just saw this picture in the newspaper, you wouldn't think to think about this as a crime because we don't know uh, technically the status of these animals in the wild, right? So we as educated people don't know about this. Can you imagine the multitude of crimes that our enforcement officers, forest officers, police officers, DRIs, customs see on a regular basis and how are they to identify crime, right? So this is another reason why wildlife crime grows to the level because it's so easy for it to go undetected. Because it's so hard to identify every single animal that may or may not be traded illegally, right? And like Disha pointed out, in certain cases, people could have the right paperwork for it, right? On an international scale, technically in this country, you could, in India today, as the law stands today, you could keep an exotic animal if you have the paperwork for it. But how many people know whether that's legal or not legal? How many people know whether to which paperwork to ask for? So, if, for example, somebody were to arrest Justin Bieber, do they know what paperwork he should have? Do they know what it should look like? Right? So this is again another place where forensics steps in and helps collect the evidence that is needed 
to establish whether or not Justin Bieber knew that he was committing a crime or was committing a crime with knowledge and this animal is endangered and he cannot be keeping it, right? So this is another example of a situation of wildlife crime. Okay, now what is this? What is this on the left? Shells, decorative items made of shells. Shells, decorative item, that's on the right. Okay, what's on the left? It's tea. It's coffee. Coffee, coffee. all right. Thank you, sir. Coffee. coffee, all right. Now, both these items are technically, legally, and biologically coming from wild animals. Both of them, depending on how they are made and sourced, how raw materials are sourced for it, could constitute a wildlife crime. Right? For example, kopi luwa. It's made from the poop of a civet cat. In parts of Indonesia, it's considered when the civet cat poops, it eats on certain coffee berries. And because of the act of going through the civet cat's digestive system, when the coffee comes out, it's considered that the coffee bean is enriched. And that has a very high asking price in the world today. In fact, Kopi Luwak today is one of the most expensive coffees to buy. Because there is this market, now suddenly there was a supply created. How? By illegally taking civet cats into captivity, keeping them in cages, force feeding them these berries, and then creating coffee powder right oh. so this it itself would constitute one kind of crime palm civet dr vanita says yes not palm civet civet cat palm civets slightly different okay then there is the uh, seashells right many of us have been to seashores we've seen shops innumerable number that are selling earrings mirrors necklaces wall hangings everything and anything made from seashells Many of these seashells are protected species, but again, the law can't do much because it's very hard to identify them for a regular officer who's not specially trained in the art of identification. So this is again ways in which wildlife crime happens right under our noses, but becomes extremely hard to detect. Okay, so here again, forensics would play a role in helping to identify what this thing is, what it is made of, and in some cases, whether it has been sourced legally or not. Okay. Then there's this. Um, what is going on here? Good job on identifying the owl. What's happening here? Good. This scratching, the harassing an animal. Harassing. Oh, wow. That's a very strong word to use on the basis of just a picture. Maybe okay. taking pictures with these animals. Yeah, they're taking pictures with this animal. All right. What else? Capturing, <laughs> capturing the owl and then use for black magic. Oh, wow. Okay, could be that. Around Diwali, you'll see this happen a lot across the country. Good job, Mitali. Okay. Shubham, you were saying something? Shubham? Quite. All right, no problem. So now this is again a typical symptom of if you were to walk into any uh, pet market across the country, you will find that animals exhibiting, Satvik says, exhibiting it for sale mostly. Absolutely right, right? So most of these times, which is what I was coming to, is very often if like for in a city like Bombay, for example, if you go to the Crawford market and you ask, if you have to take this off the counter, like you were buying candy or ice cream, he'd show you the animal, you could go to price, he'll go to price, you bargain, you take the animal home, it's yours. Nobody will ask you for paperwork, no police will come after you because people don't know how to detect, people don't know yet in our country, and when I say people, I mean enforcement agencies, they still aren't sufficiently equipped enough to understand how to tackle wildlife crime. So very often in cases where it's a whole animal, wildlife forensics has no role to play. But if the same thing was, say, for example, a titar ka meat or a chital ka meat, or any wild animal meat that was being sold off the counter as meat in a meat shop is where forensics would have to step in and help enforcement agencies identify what the species is, right? Now, why is this important? Why do we need to know uh, what species it comes from, right? Now, news comes all across the country. If you were to just set your Google email alerts, uh, news alerts to wildlife crime, every day news like this will pop up in your feed different volumes of wildlife crime happening either within our country like this or internationally where large volumes of animals are killed for meat, for pet shops. So if any of you has ever gone to Dubai on vacation 
and you have participated in the uh, dolphin show or do swimming with the dolphins program that is also a subset of wildlife crime because these wild dolphins are killed and captured in really brutal conditions without permission in extremely illegal conditions the adults are killed for meat and the young ones are taken into captivity for shows like this right so very often like i said right in the beginning we participate in acts of wildlife crime without even knowing that it is a situation of wildlife crime right which is why this crime can grow to the volume that it has grown to now why is it important for an enforcement officer to know what that animal is why is it important for a police officer forest officer to know whether it's cheetal ka meat or it's pig ka meat regular pig ka meat or um, chicken ka meat right? yes uh hi i'm megna yes um uh, you just uh, discussed about the dolphin right which yeah. is from the japan yeah. i would definitely love to draw your attention to one of the fresh water dolphins that is found in the area of bihar up that's the chambal uh, uh, yes. yes yes that's a uh, platanus gangetica yes and um, you know there is a, the poaching going on still in the in these states absolutely very same time uh, they do use them for the blubber and other products the you know, considering it to be uh, to have a medicinal property and uh, you know used for their own aesthetic purpose so Absolutely. what opinions do you think that that could be applied in our very own country in our very own nation because when we look out of our nation there are lot of cases but yes. when we dive deep into our very own situation uh, what i personally consider because um, i mean i have been in a conservation work that was a mm -hmm. part of my research in my masters while i was doing zoology mm -hmm. so i went to different uh, groups back there in uh, some of the places in bihar because i come right. from bihar right and uh, what i found the perception is actually made that they are going to defend poaching yes i mean if you're going to approach yeah. so um what do you think i want your opinion that what steps could be taken to deal with such scenario because then i think uh, only a single person cannot do a big change you need uh, ninga if you allow me the the uh, liberty of coming to your question at the end because we okay. are going to touch upon so that's why i'm coming to the law right now right so the oh absolutely a larger picture and then coming to why in india is it such a problem i'll definitely absolutely. answer your question but just to uh, take it you right now trade of wildlife whether it happens in our country or anywhere is cause for concern i think the larger picture that we need to remember is that anything that happens within our country is is any way harming our wildlife right the larger yeah. thing to remember is that unless there's international in look happening in the country india unfortunately is a very 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 chill muddy nation everything is <laughs> we'll see in our own sweet time dekhenge yaar jab jab sar ke upar se pani chale jayega then we'll start to think about how to swim right Absolutely. so that's where we stand on a lot of problems it's not just right. wildlife crime and wildlife right. crime and our attitude towards it is just symptomatic of the larger attitude of this nation towards crime in general right yeah. so yeah. having said that dolphins the gangetic dolphin that you're talking about the indo gangetic yeah. plains chambal areas are huge issues not just for poaching of dolphins poaching Absolutely. of gharial sand mining habitat destruction okay. right so so many complex problems all tied into one now unfortunately we can't cover the length and breadth of every single state but oh, i'm so glad true. that you brought this up because i'm hoping that the readers will take so this and use this as a bouncing board to go back and read more about these i wish we had a whole day to sit in person and pick up every problem <laughs> and you know talk about it but we don't have the liberty to do that but great uh, you know thank you for bringing that up and uh, i'm glad you brought you. that up at this stage because that's where i was coming to with the act right okay. so when we talk about international species like i said we are crippled by the fact that we don't have laws that allow our forest officers and customs officers and other officers to take action we are very fortunate that we have one of the strongest acts in the world to take action for any crime that happen, happens against species that are found within the country right so two of these primarily the wildlife protection act and the forest act right and largely for recording or uh, booking of any offense against wild animal that is found in the country endemic to the country forest officers would use the wildlife protection act okay now to 
take Megha's question and to merge it into the larger picture. Megha, I hope I've at least scratched the surface of what, uh, Megna, I hope I've at least scratched the surface of what you wanted me to touch upon, but I'll come back Absolutely. to your uh, question in the Q&A. Yeah, we can talk yeah. more about this. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So the Wildlife Protection Act primarily is a, a very, very well-written, concise piece of legislation that not only talks about what is a wild animal, which are wild animals are protected, how are they protected, what are the different kinds of crimes, who are the officers that are empowered to take action against a wildlife offense, what kind of evidence can be recorded, and what kind of punishments can be given. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but let's try and do a small exercise. What do you think is the maximum punishment in terms of jail uh, for a wildlife criminal? Any Sadhik, you'll have to be a little louder, Baba. Can't hear you at all. It's 25 years, supposedly. Could you say that again? Your voice is very muffled. Or just maybe type it in the chat box. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Jail for lifetime. A jail for lifetime, how I wish. 25 years of imprisonment. Sadhik, I wish you were the lawmaker. I vote for Satvik for the next law minister of this country. Okay, no, unfortunately, it's three to seven years of imprisonment, the maximum being seven years imprisonment. The fines vary from 10,000 to five lakhs, depending on the severity of the crime, whether it's a first time offense, which animal has been killed, so on and so forth. There are different variables that a judge has to consider, right? Now, the beautiful thing about this wildlife protection something yes doc cannot certain no sound trying to say something. okay now the beautiful thing about the wildlife protection act the way it's written it's so simplistic in its language it gives forest officers tremendous number of special powers giving them and enabling them to take extremely swift and strong action against wildlife criminals and like megna was pointing out dolphins in the chambal region and several other species are listed within the wildlife protection act in different ways right now what are these ways very important for you to know there is a system of schedules under the wildlife protection act there are six schedules in total the animals that face the most severe threats are listed under schedule one and two slightly lesser threats are schedule three and four animals that have faced that are not considered to be wildlife that anyone should care about are unfortunately listed as vermin in schedule five and plants that need to be protected are listed in schedule six now, the problem with the schedules, while they're an extremely empowering part of the act, is that they haven't been amended. So a lot of the situations where you see that, uh, you know, new species that are being discovered are not covered under the act because this act is not robustly amended. Secondly, there is lacuna in the terms of animals that are declared as vermin even includes fruit bats, which we know are extremely important for uh, the ecological survival of our ecosystems, for fruiting trees that are extremely important uh, as, uh, you know, animals that spread forest uh, life. Uh, while number six includes certain plants, this is not a very exhaustive list. So this act does need a lot of amendment, but yet even in its existing form, it's an extremely empowering and enabling one. Now, why am I pointing out these schedules to you? Depending on which schedule the animal is listed under, the seriousness of the offense is taken or the cognizance of the seriousness of the offense is taken by the judge. And accordingly, evidence has to be presented in front of a judge. The most important evidence that has to be presented in front of a judge is the determination of the species of the animal, especially in cases where visual examination does not allow the judge or the prosecuting officer to understand exactly which species is it. Okay, so for example, if you go back to the thing we just discussed where uh, Meghna talked about the fact that dolphins are being killed and their blubber is being sold. So if somebody were to catch a criminal who is transporting blubber from a wild dolphin that has been killed, the, the thing that they will have to first do is identify whether that blubber comes from this dolphin or not. And then the forest officer will have to book a case saying that an offense has been committed against schedule one species or schedule two, three or four, depending on which schedule the animal is listed in, and then present the case in front of the judge. Unfortunately, from the time of detection to the time of presentation of the, of the trial in the courtroom and the beginning of the proceedings of the trial is a long drawn process, right? Several times 
uh, forest officers base their entire cases on eyewitness statements, eyewitnesses die in the 10, 10, 20 years it takes for cases to be heard and uh, sentences to be given. So it's a very long run process. So now increasingly what forest officers are finding is that if they steer away from eyewitness testimony and start to rely more strongly on forensic evidence, scientific evidence, then they have a far stronger chance of winning that case which is why now there is an increasing surge in the demand for and the need for wildlife forensics within the country. Okay, now I wanted to again bring to your notice. If you look at the way the uh, punishments are written in the act, they're very interesting. Firstly, any offense that occurs within a core area of a tiger reserve. A tiger reserve is a conjunction between a national park and a wildlife sanctuary, usually an area identified as a tiger reserve because tigers in that territory are found to move between that that uh, area and that's very important for their genetic maintenance. So tiger reserves are declared and as far as the act is concerned, a tiger reserve is the most important wild space. Below that comes a wildlife sanctuary, national park, uh, conservation reserves, community reserves and so on, right? So any offense that occurs in the core area of a tiger reserve, three to seven years of jail and fine that's not less than 50,000 that may go up to two lakhs, right? So this is how this act is written. Now, if offenses were to occur in a city, for example, against a species that's a Schedule 1 or a Part 2 of Schedule 2, three to seven years of jail, fine not less than 10,000. If it's a Schedule 3 or 4 species, the judge has the power to sentence up to three years of jail, a fine of 25,000 or both, right? So as you can see, there is no ambiguity in the act whatsoever, as long as the officer who's presenting the case can prove that the animal is a wild animal, comes from one of the schedules under which it is protected and the said uh, act is an act of offense as prescribed by the act, then the judge has tremendous power to sentence this individual to very serious consequence. Unfortunately, this is where the problem starts. Forest officers are not able to very often establish beyond reasonable doubt that this animal or a part that they have caught from a wild poacher or a, a wildlife criminal or they have confiscated from someone's home actually comes from a wild animal. Paperwork is weak, evidences are not recorded correctly, labs are not able to provide the correct reports several times because the DNA is not possible in every single case. So these are several of the issues that make it difficult for forensics evidence to be used concretely in a courtroom, in wildlife courts. Uh, just to quickly spend a minute on CITES, so we, Indian law, there are two main acts like I spoke about. Parallelly, there is also the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna called CITES. It's an international convention. India is one of the oldest parties to this uh, convention. Unfortunately, even though we, we are one of the oldest, we still today do not have any law that concretely allows us to take action against people who illegally trade in CITES listed species. Classic example are your African grey parrots that you can buy off the counter in a place like Crawford Market. These are appendix one species of the CITES, yet action cannot be taken once they are bought into a market and then they can be openly traded. Right? So here again uh, is an issue that comes in uh, as far as wildlife crime is concerned. However, we are hoping that now with upcoming amendments that are due for the Wildlife Protection Act, a part of CITES, or at least an entire chapter on CITES, powers under the CITES, crimes under CITES, will also be included under the Wildlife Protection Act, enabling forest officers and other officers in this country to take action against this crime, right? Um, when that does happen, I'll share news through Nature's Eye, and hopefully all of you will uh, learn further about it, okay? Now, um, trade, whether it happens within the country, local species or exotic species coming into this country is tremendously problematic, not just from a legal perspective, but also from a cruelty angle. Things that people must remember are that wildlife crime, when somebody places and demand for say one African gray parrot, at least 20 of those parrots are caught in the wild to factor for the fact that in the journey they make from Congo, where they are found naturally to India, several of them will die. Maybe a handful, five or six will survive that journey, disease, infighting and all of that, that the stress of travel that will happen. And those few are the ones that you see in the market. So don't be fooled by just one or two birds that you see in the market or in someone's home. The crime is actually far, far larger than those few animals, okay? Uh, now, how does forensics tie into all of this, okay? 
uh, quickly, forensics today in the country, the way it is, there are three main ways in which it is uh, practiced. Obviously, there's research and development where laboratories, uh, either directly the forensic science laboratories under the central government or under state governments are developing techniques through which they can use the forensics to uh, fight wildlife crime. Uh, laboratories are set up by different institutes uh, to make them available for testing and analysis for police and forest forces. And then there are several agencies like WCT who work, like who I work for, where we develop application in the field. So we create capacity for forest staff to understand how to use it, judges how forensic evidence must be applied, create the capacity for them to have kits available, so on and so forth. Right. So depending on where your interest lies, there are different ways in which you could contribute to the growth of and the practice of wildlife forensics. Um, like with any other forensics, whether human forensics or wildlife forensics, the tenet remains the same. The basic funda, the basic principle remains the same, is that whenever a crime occurs, you have to be able to link the criminal and the crime scene to the crime and to each other. Right. We call this the justice triangle. Now, all of these have to be proved through the availability of strong, reliable evidence. In most cases, forensic evidence provides that undeniable linkage. Now, in cases of wildlife crime, it's a little more simpler in that all you need to establish when reporting a crime are three things. One is a species identification, because as you saw in the law, different species are listed differently and hence offenses are punishable differently. The idea of the suspects, people who are suspected to have committed that offense, and the actual occurrence of the offense. So if you're saying, for example, Samyukta has traded uh, illegally in African gray parrots, you have to show that what you thought found in my house or in my shop were African gray parrots. The shop or the house belongs to me. I'm the one principally trading it, and I do not have the requisite paperwork to trade that animal. Right? So you have to develop and establish all of these things. For several of these linkages, forensics can play a large role. In some cases, because wildlife forensics isn't as well developed as blue collar or, or cyber forensics, these linkages may not be possible. Uh, the routine process that happens is in a wildlife crime situation, say for example, an animal has died or a forest officer gets a tip off that an animal is being traded or that somebody is illegally keeping a part of a wild animal, right? A POR is filed, which is very different from an FIR, right? Without getting too much into the legality of it, an FIR is a starting point of an investigation in the sense that without an FIR being filed, police officers cannot take action. Whereas a POR is a differently enabling tool in that with the basis of information, a forest officer can start an investigation. And once he has sufficient grounds to believe that actually an offense has occurred, he can then take it to court as and when he is ready. Right, so slight legal differences. Then uh, investigation happens at the scene, suspects are uh, arrested, uh, evidences are collected, depending on what the kind of evidence is and what the kind of offenses, different forensic examinations are called for. And then the paperwork is presented in front of a court. The judges will hear the various evidences and eventually pronounce the judgment. All of this is dictated by the Wildlife Protection Act in collaboration with the Criminal Procedure Code and the Indian Evidence Act. Okay. Now, what are the kinds of evidences that can be used? To start with, obviously, there is the basic documentary evidence. Uh, POR is the starting point. And there are statements. Uh, the Wildlife Protection Act is one of those unique acts. Unlike any crime that occurs against humans, when there is a crime that occurs against animals, forest officer of a specific rank known as the ACF or the Assistant Conservator of Forest has the power to take a statement and this statement can be used as evidence in a court of law. This is very unlike how human crimes are dealt with. Okay. Then if the area is a protected area, those notifications, does the person who's arresting this person or the criminal, does he have the powers to investigate under the act? Uh, final sketch of the crime scene, the usual set of things that a forensic investigation or a crime scene investigation would entail. In addition, this would be supported by physical evidence, what we call physical evidence in, in forensics parlance, which would include um, weapons, tools, articles, skins, hides, bones, meat, depending on the case, different evidences would be used to establish the offense in particular. Now, like I said, three main things to be proven in a wildlife uh, crime, right? Identification of the animal, 
which is the paramount thing the occurrence and nature uh, and scene of the crime the identification presence and activity of the criminal now largely the way wildlife forensics functions today there are a handful of four or five laboratories that can under that can undertake the work of the first point which is the identification of the animal there are only four or five laboratories the occurrence nature of the crime scene the identification presence of the criminal these can be done by the already established and well functioning central or state forensic science laboratories that anyway do these services for police and other agencies so the problem lies like i said the first step of any wildlife crime investigation is the identification of the animal the species of the animal right so there itself if we are fumbling and we don't have the means in every case to identify that animal or the species correctly accurately enough for a court then we can't proceed with the case forward so this is another place where forensics could or can't help depending on the kind of crime and the amount of evidence available and if testing for that formula of evidence is available to give you a simple example um if somebody is caught with cheetal meat it's very easy for the forest officer to send that meat sample to a forensic lab have it tested through dna and identified as cheetal meat but if a roadside vendor is selling sande ka tel which is a which is a very popularly sold oil made from spiny tail lizard parts dissolved in it we currently don't have the capacity to be able to test whether or not that oil actually has sande ka tel in it and the animal sanda or the spiny tail lizard is protected under the wildlife protection act so technically the selling the buying the keeping the using of that of that oil is an offense right so depending on the situation and the capacity forensics may or may not be able to help a forest officer or a police officer or a customs officer in investigating in a situation of wildlife crime um now we often hear about uh, you know cases of ivory uh, cases of uh, skins cases of uh, uh, tiger uh, bones tiger meat the large mega fauna that we all read about right now these are very commonly traded animals but unfortunately this is just a small part of the kind of animals that are traded in wildlife right which is why it makes it very very complex for uh, an investigating officer to work with Uh, wildlife evidence in human crimes all the forensic scientist has to do is say okay does it come from this human or this human or that human is it this blood group or that blood group or that blood group does this knife have fingerprints from this person or that person or that person but in wildlife forensics because the variety of species is so large because the number of species protected under the act is so large and not all of them uh, samples coming from them or the way they are traded the the specimen itself may not fit or may not yield results with an existing test so that creates a huge level of complexity which is why you don't read about uh, successes with wildlife crime cases the same way you read about successes with drugs or rapes or theft or uh, drunken driving and other such cases where there are established uh, scientific tests that can be used to prove the offense now the other problem is uh depending on the way within a particular species itself the way the the animal is used so for example within a tiger for instance right so the tiger bone the tiger whiskers tiger meat tiger skin tiger tails tiger blood tiger urine everything has a demand somewhere in the world for some reason or the other and depending on how process, processed it is by the time the forest officer or the police officer detects that offense happening the available technique that is used in say another case very similar to it may not apply to this same case so currently the way wildlife forensics is it's not a one size fits all uh, solution the way human forensics works for most cases so if it's a poisoning case in a humans you have a standard set of tests that you can run to identify which poison you can do that to a very small extent in wildlife cases but not very successfully also because wildlife criminals have understood how to get away with these crimes and because it's such a large organized market there is a lot of effort put in by the wildlife criminals to make their crimes as undetectable as possible right so from creating fake tiger skins and misleading police with that or um, 
creating replicas of things made out of say an ivory elephant ivory or a gore a bone or a skin of a jackal to such an extent that it's very hard to detect whether it came from a living being the industry of wildlife criminals has become so prolific that unfortunately wildlife forensics has not been able to keep up with the way wildlife crime has grown but still there is hope and we are growing as an industry we're growing as a science we're growing as somebody who's looking to combat wildlife crime so those of you who are looking at careers in this there's tremendous scope it's only going to become bigger and bigger and better okay now another facet of illegal wildlife trade which is slightly lesser talked about at least in the common man circle is the fact that while there is still a lot of the brutal killing of wild animals in forests undetected uh, the larger volume of illegal wildlife trade has moved on to the net onto the internet today it's very easy for lay people like you and me to go onto the internet find a buyer or a seller on olx facebook name the platform and actually procure something very easily without being detected for uh, illegal wildlife trade so there is an agency that is called the wildlife crime control bureau which is a central government agency they have been making efforts by trying to work with several um, uh, of these companies to create mechanisms by which wildlife crime can be detected that's happening online but they haven't been greatly successful having said that now there are entire cyber crime units that are dedicated to the development of tools to combat wildlife crime that happens online so if there's any of you here that's looking for a career to use their it knowledge or their cyber interests this is a great space for you to consider work with uh, the wildlife crime control bureau is also setting up several states including maharashtra have set up wildlife crime uh, cyber cells within their own states and these are only growing more prolifically so tools are not just in the uh, traditional blue collar dna blood uh, species identification there is also this wildlife forensics detection side that's coming up which is with the cyber crime okay so with that i hope i've given you a sufficient uh, overview of uh, you know what is wildlife crime where is the forensics and obviously we're going to go into the depth of each of the techniques that i kind of uh, just mentioned briefly uh, in the longer session but if you guys have any questions i'm happy to take them now uh, ma'am i want to ask a question sure sure uh, like ma'am uh, a shocking incidents uh, come across in news a mm -hmm. rape a monitor lizard by four men right so according to wildlife protection act mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, punishment uh, they get and please elab elaborate this so monitor lizards uh, are covered under schedule 2 and schedule 4 of the wildlife protection act this would come under uh, a it would largely fit under the a uh, hunting definition so the definition of hunting in the wildlife protection act i didn't want to touch upon that in this small session now but it's one of the widest definitions you can see of any crime right so agar aap janwar ko awaaz bhi de rahe ho usko khana bhi khila rahe ho if you're chasing that animal if you're beating a drum around that animal even that constitutes hunting as far as the wildlife protection act is concerned so this would technically fit under the ambit of that now like i showed you the offense itself has to there are three main things that are looked at what is the schedule under which it fits right and where is the area where this offense has occurred so these people did this offense inside a tiger reserve it would be an extremely seriously dealt with if it was in a village in a remote area not near a forested land it would be slightly less seriously uh, the punishment would be slightly less serious the offense is just as serious okay so that's the only difference yeah sure. other than that there is another act which i did not speak about because that's not just wildlife specific it talks about all animals it's called the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 now unfortunately this act was created as far back as in 1960 and back then rupees 50 was a very large amount right today we are in 2022 and the punishment for hurting an animal anyway including sexual misconduct with an animal would come under this act right and the penalty for it is only rupees 50 okay over and above this the police also has the powers of ipc where certain sections of brutality and unnatural behavior like section 4 of uh, 474 used to be there for uh, homosexual activity till recently was considered so that also they could apply here depending on the circumstance right however i don't know if 
they would be able to establish whether or not this animal was actually sexually harassed. It would take a lot of veterinarian evidence, etc. So I would hold comment on that because we don't know the facts of the matter. It's a piece of reporting. It could be a misreported situation. It could be that something else was said and something else was reported. But however, if it is as it is reported, then, are, then there are these legal tools available to the forest department. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, this is Dr. Abra from Karnataka. I, yes, I actually sir. research on mushrooms, but I was very interested in to receive the, the wildlife categories and wildlife forensics and wildlife right. habitats and all. Right. So my question is, uh, in a market, we see so many uh, leather products, like mm -hmm. bells, jackets mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. Whether they really come from the animals or, I mean, they are like synthetically, I mean, ready for so, the product. If I may take the liberty to sound like a salesperson, how much money you give to it? Right? No, no. Actually, I didn't take anything. But no, the thing I'm asking that. I, mean... to... I know you didn't take. I'm answering your question. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, for example, if something is made from authentic wild animal uh, leather, apart from the yeah. fact that there are several techniques through which that can be detected, the fact is that uh, there's a lot of manpower effort that goes into making. Firstly, they have to pay off, uh, bribe certain hands so that they can get into the forest area and get that animal. There's a lot of chemicals they have to invest in to cure that leather. They have to find the right buyers for it because yeah. they can't go about saying my tiger ka belt bana ke bech raho, ya saap ka belt bana ke bech raho, because that's illegal, right? So the idea is yes, of course, yeah. there's still a large volume of market for animal hide and animal hide products like belts and bags and so on and so forth. But it is not a market that common people like you and me can afford easily because these are high end products. These are top dollar products. Right, because they've invested so much money, they will charge a very high premium for it. Right, that's not to say that's not to say great, well done, wildlife criminal. You know, you've created a price for this, but that's the unfortunate thing. So while you maybe up market me jaate ho, they sell you a belt and say this is pure animal leather. Yeah. Right. Yes. It could be dog yeah. leather. It could be cow leather. It could be calf leather. It could be any leather. Right. Yes. So even yes. those things today, there are tests forensically to detect what animal it comes from. So depends on the quality depends on the price point depends on where you're buying it from the the more expensive the product the more clandestinely you are having to buy it the higher the chances that it's actually coming from a wild animal agar open market mein bik raha hai yeah. in a store that is legally set up less are the chances that it's come from a wild animal because detection is much easier and people know are now very aware of the consequences of selling anything made from a wild animal Okay, I mean the thing is it comes completely illegal. That is any 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 animal harm for the leather products. Yes. If the animal yes, yes. is listed under the Wildlife Protection Act, any of the schedules one to four, yes. it is illegal. Yeah. You cannot yeah. sell hide. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. No problem. Any other questions? Uh, oh, uh, yes, ma what, uh, yes ma we can do as a researcher in this field, like uh, what we can do oh, as a researcher. The sky is the limit, my dear. So, uh, if, what are you uh, studying, Mitali? I completed my uh, post graduation in geology. In zoology, oh, fantastic! So, definitely, there's oh, tremendous scope for people to create kits wherein you know. So, like I said, the biggest problem is. If I'm a forest officer and I've caught you, say for example, and you have meat in your hands, right? I need to be able to detect on the spot where I have caught you that the meat with you is coming from a wild animal. Unfortunately, we don't have those rapid action kits available. So, or tests that a simple microscopic test or a simple test that I could do with a, a simple enough portable device. So in terms of research, the, the scope is so huge to create tools that forest officers, police officers, customs officers can employ in the field so that that preliminary detection on the basis of that, they can then take more action. The problem happens because the detection time only is so long that by the time the system has become dila, the criminal has become certain that he will be out of bail, he will run, he will never be right? So a lot of these problems are, would be solved if there was available kits like that. So hopefully you'll next I'll hear Mitali has made some kits that we can use. Yeah. Yes, All right. Yes. Great. Okay, Ishwari, your your turn. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
actually my name is ishwari and i am currently studying veterinary and i have a doubt that at what level veterinarians can help uh, biggest, in this wildlife forest the biggest level okay two things one uh, every tiger reserve in the country today is required to hire a veterinarian as part of their official team okay so i would recommend if you haven't already finish your masters in veterinary sciences okay and if you haven't finish it and then get employed by or even if you haven't at least with your bvsc look for a tiger reserve in the state where you are they will all now require to hire veterinarians number 2 okay. any and every wildlife ngo that's working in this country has a program that veterinarians can function including wct okay so you can send your cvs to all these ngos they regularly post applications and needs for veterinarians to come on board not okay. all work will involve hands on work with wildlife directly depending on your seniority you may have to start slightly lower and rescue centers you may then be moved up but there's tremendous scope for veterinarians in the wildlife crime space and the wildlife conservation space in at large okay yeah okay ma'am all right hello yes Who's yeah it's dr vinita speaking yes, samyukta yes we yeah samyukta we uh, my direct question is what yeah. to do to develop a forensic lab because we are pressing hard here to establish a short facility in our right. university right so because the funding uh, uh, similar they are saying yeah we are providing the funding and but still whenever we didn't have the funding it is not possible for us to develop yes. or establish yes. a facility here right uh, dr vinita if i may ask which uh, college or lab are you in central it? university i am i am working as assistant professor in central okay. university of jammu okay and uh, previously i worked in wildlife forensic cell wildlife institute of india dehradun oh fantastic under dr so, goel yeah yeah dr goel oh, with dr fantastic. goel sir yeah then to have all the answers available dr goel is your yeah best yeah he, he yeah yeah dr goel is with us only and he is also saying so we are because everywhere uh, man i mean the major problem if i may recommend the best bet you would have is to approach the jammu and kashmir forest yeah department. already i already i so already so why i'm saying is talk to them well in advance before a budgeting cycle because now the way forest departments can work and for example in maharashtra mm -hmm. the wildlife forensic labs that have been set up have been set up in collaboration with the forest department yeah. so they are procuring funding through central schemes and using that money then they are setting up the lab yeah, we already contacted we already contacted under the campa and other these right. funds and yeah already contacted with them okay. and we are in process of that but uh, once we have the sample or whatever it is mm -hmm. and one more issue is government yeah. issued a letter mm -hmm. that only th two or three con this one constitutions or two th or three labs are only able to provide or what their reports will be authentic Right. under which the mumbai the pune one the tamil nadu one arinagar one those are also not comes under them right. only right. the wii only the zsi so, the bsi ma'am that is going to change very soon don't worry about that the problem is that uh, you know when these policies are released a lot of the people who are pushing for these policies have ulterior motives you show you i'm sure you understand yeah yeah, yeah i can understand yeah, yeah. but uh, these this thing will change the landscape is changing very fast right yeah. states are now required to take very strict action and a large part of that is going to be to have forensic facilities so if you looked at the national wildlife action plan to 2017 2031 one of the big mandates of the ministry of environment and forest climate change is to ensure that wildlife forensic capacity is developed at the state level yeah yes don't lose heart there is definitely maharashtra has done it mp is doing it definitely it's a slow process it's a very disheartening process maine 15 saal nikal diye hain isme main samajh sakti hu bilkul samajh sakti hu cheez ke liye it's one day at a time one day at a yeah, time we'll yeah. get there because yeah, we are working we are working we and continuously we are developing uh, yeah one more thing yes. as you told we are working on developing uh, this one on spot identification kits and mm -hmm. mobile apps oh fantastic because, because fantastic. nabbing is nabbing is necessary how yes. wct we can collaborate with wct mm hmm Uh, uh, ma'am, will you? I'll leave my email ID. In fact, right away. And yeah, sure, can, sure. Uh, if you can send me an email, we'll have this discussion separately. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Why not? And, Why uh, not? I'll take this forward with my team. I'll put you in yeah. touch at least with the. Uh, I mean, I definitely. And then, uh, my boss works very closely with the Jammu and Kashmir Forest Department, so we can okay, definitely okay. figure out having a meeting, understanding what you need further. Yeah, If yeah. If there's something that the state wildlife board can do to push it, I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, take that action. Yeah, yeah. In collaboration, we can do many things. Absolutely. Yeah, collaboration yeah. Collaboration is key. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Lovely meeting you. Thank you. you.
All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Shubham. Shubham, please show us your face. I refuse to answer your question without seeing your face. Okay, ma'am. Even if you're in your pajamas or your shorts, doesn't matter. No, no. Hi, Shubham. Okay. Hello, ma'am. Hi. I'm visible. Yes. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. मैम मेरा क्वेश्चन ये था कि मान लो हमारा कोई एनिमल है वो इंटरनेशनल बॉर्डर पे ट्रेड करते हुए पकड़ा गया है ओके तो मैम उसको हम कैसे ट्रेस करेंगे कि वो किस कंट्री से आया मान लो क्योंकि थर्ड कंट्री में उसे ट्रेडिंग करी जा रही है तो हमें कैसे पता लगेगा कि कहाँ से हो रहा और मैम जैसे मतलब ये एक पूरा एनिमल है उसको मैम डिवाइड कर डिवाइड करके ट्रेडिंग होगी रखो वहाँ से रखो ऊपर मैम उसके जो प्रोडक्ट होंगे उसको हम कैसे टेस्ट कर पाएंगे कि यहाँ यहाँ इसकी ट्रेडिंग हुई तो शुभम इसका एक दो दो पार्ट है आपके क्वेश्चन के तो पहला जो पार्ट है जो आपने पूछा कि जब बॉर्डर पे एनिमल पकड़ा जाएगा तो कैसे ट्रेस करेंगे की कौन से देश से आ रहा है राइट तो इसके पास हमारे लिए प्रॉब्लम कहाँ से शुरू होती है कि टेक्निकली जब भी भी कोई एनिमल ट्रेड होता है लीगली राइट पेपर वर्क होता है उसका सो फॉर एग्जांपल मैं बांग्लादेश से कोई जानवर ला रही हूँ इंडिया में अगर लीगली कर रही हूँ तो बांग्लादेश के साइटी सेल और इंडिया के साइटी सेल के थ्रू मुझे दोनों के पेपर वर्क चाहिए होंगे वो जानवर के डिटेल्स चाहिए होंगे बट अगर वो जानवर मान लीजिए बांग्लादेश से निकल इंडिया के थ्रू कहीं और जा रहा है और सिर्फ इंडिया को यूज किया जा रहा है ट्रांजिट के लिए मेरे लिए बहुत मुश्किल होगा अगर लीगली है ये पता कराना कि वो एग्जैक्टली exactly कहाँ से आया है उसके लिए मेरा सेफेस्ट बेट होगा कि जो एनफोर्समेंट एजेंसी है जो इंटेरोगेशन कर रही है दे विल यूज सेवरल इंटेरोगेशन टूल्स इन्वेस्टिगेशन टूल्स इन्फॉर्मेंट्स को यूज करेंगे ये पता लगाने के लिए कि ये लोग निकले कहाँ से सो so, उस केस में बेस्ट ऑप्शन है इन्फॉर्मेशन का जिन लोगों के साथ वो एनिमल पकड़ा गया उसके अलावा बहुत मुश्किल होगा क्योंकि ऐसा नहीं है हमारे देश में इंटरनेशनली कि अभी डेटा डीएनए डेटा सेट्स क्रिएट किए जाते हैं कि हर जानवर लोकली एंडेमिकली कहाँ पाई जाएगी वहीं से आ रही है वगैरह पता नहीं है राइट इसमें क्लासिक एग्जांपल है जो रिसेंटली कैंगरू वाला केस हुआ था वेस्ट बेंगाल में हम सबको पता है कि कैंगरू इज ऑस्ट्रेलिया का जानवर बट वी ऑल्सो नो की साउथ ईस्ट एशिया में कई सारे कैंगरू फार्मिंग फार्म है तो हो सकता है वहां से वो जानवर आया हो तो इसमें बहुत सारी कठिनाई हो सकती है जरूरी नहीं है कि हर सिचुएशन में हमें पता चले अभी जो आपको दूसरी पार्ट है वो थोड़ा सरल है बिकॉज अगर हमने किसी को पकड़ा है मान लीजिए मुझे पकड़ा है आपने वे तो मीट का सैंपल और ऐसे ही और आपको पता लगा है कि मेरे पास कैंगरू का मीट है और आपने दस और लोगों को पकड़ा है जिनके पास कैंगरू के दूसरे पार्ट है राइट तो सिंपल आंसर है इसमें मेरे पास जो पाया गया कैंगरू का मीट है उसका डीएनए एनालिसिस करेंगे और वही डीएनए क्या स्पीशीज वाला डीएनए क्या बाकी लोगों के पास से भी बरामद हुआ और उसके अलावा क्या हम हम हमारे बीच में आप कोई लिंक इस्टेब्लिश कर पाए क्या हमने एक दूसरे से बातचीत की क्या हमारे बीच में कोई फाइनेंशियल ट्रांजैक्शन हुआ क्या मैंने कुछ पैसे उनको भेजे क्या मैंने उन, उनसे व्हाट्सएप पे या फोन पे बात की या फेसबुक पे उनसे बात की सो so, लिंक बनाने पड़ेंगे जिसमें थोड़े पार्ट साइबर फोरेंसिक्स के होंगे और थोड़े रेगुलर फोरेंसिक्स वाले लिंक होंगे पॉसिबल है टाइम लगेगा बट करना जरूरी है और आजकल बहुत सारे क्राइम्स में जो स्पेशली इंटरनेशनल अंतरराष्ट्रीय स्तर पर जो हो रही हैं जैसे बांग्लादेश yes. इंडिया चाइना नेपाल ये सारे बॉर्डर्स के थ्रू रशिया जापान वगैरह जा रही है इसमें अभी पैसा भी लगाया जा रहा है टू डिटेक्ट दीज क्राइम्स थैंक यू मैम ऑल राइट शुभम थैंक यू एनी अदर क्वेश्चन Uh, ma'am, I want to ask a question. Yes, Mitali. Uh, like, ma'am, a uh, few days ago, I attend a, a workshop on organized crime, environmental mm -hmm. organized crime. Mm -hmm. So, ma'am, actually, I want to ask that uh, uh, what is the proper definition of orga organized crime? Like, if four or three people are only no. doing any crime, That's known as organized crime. crime. No, so organized crime is when a crime becomes like an industry, like a sector. Where there is a proper and establishable de demand and supply chain, where there are financial transactions that are happening between people, where trade is technically happening, right? So, if I take an example of, uh, say, human trafficking, right? There are certain people who will go and pick up kids from different places across the country. फिर उनके बाद एक middleman आएगा जो इन बच्चों को इकट्ठा करके he'll find a way to smuggle them into another country. उस दूसरे कंट्री में भी एक पॉइंट ऑफ कांटेक्ट होगा हु विल देन फाइंड अ वे टू डिस्पर्स देम टू डिफरेंट बायर्स 
फिर अल्टीमेटली एक बायर होगा सो वेन देर इज अ फॉर्मल सेटअप लाइक एनी अदर बिजनेस ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम इज कॉल्ड वाई ऑर्गेनाइज बिकॉज देर इज ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इन इट इट्स नॉट रैंडम स्पोराडिक नहीं है कि कोई इंसान तीन लोग उठ के मुझे उस बच्चे को किडनेप करना है बिकॉज उस मुझे उनके माता पिता से पैसे चाहिए चलो उनको उठा के ले चलते हैं ऐसा नहीं है इट्स अ फार्म ऑर्गेनाइज रैकेट देर आर मिडल मैन इन्वॉल्व देर आर प्लेयर्स इन्वॉल्व वेरी ऑफन देर इज ह्यूज वॉल्यूम्स ऑफ करप्शन इन्वॉल्व एंड पैसा दस लाख बीस लाख की बात नहीं है करोड़ों की बात होती है उसमें राइट सो दैट दीज आर सम ऑफ द फ्यू टेल टेल मार्कर्स ऑफ ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम इट्स एन इंडस्ट्री बेसिकली इट्स रन लाइक एन इंडस्ट्री so ma'am why these makeup in the cosmetic industries and these uh, big brands who use a bag of reptiles skin hmm. is hmm. these all come in the organized crime they they wouldn't fit under the the players of organized crime but they are the ultimate benefiters of organized crime in the sense that unhone to demand place ki इसी वजह से कहीं तो वाइल्ड लाइफ में किसी एक जानवर को पकड़ के मार के किसी मिडलमैन के थ्रू उसको एक्सपोर्ट करके इंपोर्ट करके उनके पास पहुंचाया गया राइट अब नदर थिंग आई वांट टू पॉइंट आउट इज बैक इन द डे मे बी अ डेकेड अगो ब्रांड्स लाइक लकोस्ते एडिडास एवरीबॉडी हैड अ रेंज ऑफ मेड फ्रॉम प्योर एनिमल स्टफ नाउ बिकॉज़ इंटरनेशनली इट इज लुक्ड डाउन अपॉन टू यूज वाइल्ड लाइफ प्रोडक्ट लॉट ऑफ दीस ब्रांड्स हैव स्टॉप्ड दिस प्रैक्टिस या तो वो सिर्फ सेलेक्ट कस्टमर्स के लिए बनाते हैं जो ऑन डिमांड बोलते हैं कि भैया मुझे क्रोकोडाइल स्किन का बैग बनवा दो या ऐसे कर दो इट्स नॉट अ यू कैन गो टू अ शॉप टुडे एंड बाय समथिंग मेड फ्रॉम एन एनिमल दैट इज प्रोटेक्टेड इट्स नॉट एज इजी एज इट वाज 10 इयर्स अगो ओके सो द सीन इज चेंजिंग इट्स रैपिडली चेंजिंग बिकॉज़ इंटरनेशनली अभी वाइल्ड लाइफ क्राइम को बहुत सीरियसली देखा जा रहा है एज अ सीरियस ऑफेंस दस साल पहले बोलते थे कि अरे जानवर मरे तो मरे इंसान कितने मर रहे हैं बट टुडे देर पीपल आर सीइंग द को रिलेशन दे आर नॉट सेपरेट थिंग्स दे आर ऑल इंटर रिलेटेड सो चेंज आएगा इट्स नो लॉन्गर हाउ वी यूज टू सी इन मूवीज एंड मीडिया सेम और डिफरेंट a uh, slightly different in that veterinary forensics would uh, be a veterinarian doing a typical post mortem to understand cause of death time of death location of death so on and so forth wildlife mm-hmm. forensics is not necessarily a so if you think about it in a larger perspective a veterinary forensics is a subset of wildlife forensics where in okay. wildlife forensics is a large umbrella of different techniques that can be used so for wildlife the- forensics mein post mortem nahi hota wildlife forensics may a small part of the activity is post mortem depending on what the case is so for example agar tiger mara hai as far as india is concerned whichever tiger dies in whichever state a post mortem has to be done okay but it may not necessarily so for example okay. if i'm catching somebody with a okay. tiger meat obviously there's no animal for me to do a post mortem on तो पोस्टमार्टम तभी होगा व्हेन आई फाइंड जानवर का बॉडी समवेयर इन अ क्राइम सीन और या जंगल के अंदर मरा पड़ा मिला या किसी तालाब में मुझे मरा हुआ जानवर मिला ओनली देन आई कैन इनिशिएट अ पोस्टमार्टम राइट ओके मुझे एक और डाउट है हाँ. कि ये जो पोस्टमार्टम होता भी है टाइगर्स का ये कौन करता है फॉरेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट वाले करेंगे कि जो वेटनेरियन वेटनेरियन लाइक आई टोल्ड यू एवरी फॉरेस्ट एवरी टाइगर रिजर्व हैज टू हैव अ वेटनेरियन सो इफ द If the tiger is died inside a tiger reserve, only O tiger reserve ka veterinarian is allowed to do the post mortem. If it is not a tiger reserve, it's a wildlife sanctuary or a national park, then the okay. government authorized veterinarian will come and be asked to do the post mortem. Okay. So, if he has to go to the veterinarian post, then for that, he has to give government exams. Or we can directly apply. Directly apply. Uh, you can directly apply when the post opens through the government, through the forest department. Yeah. That's why I said speak okay. to your yeah. this forest department, see what they are, when they are going to open up. post next etc okay. and one of the easiest ways is to start by working with an ngo in your region that already works with the forest department that way your okay. exposure line is directly and it's a far more better exposure line okay thank you ma'am welcome ishri any other questions hello ma'am yes so yes. i want a suggestion from you actually yes. so there are some students of zoology in my university Uh-huh. So whenever I ask, actually they have uh, a, a dissertation work in the third sem and fourth sem. Right. So whenever I ask them, so what you are doing? I mean, what title you have choiced? Hmm. So they told that no, sir, we can't. We can't do anything because we reside in a dry area and all such things. Yeah. So I, I want a suggestion from you that what they can do as a part of dissertation, uh, so that so they can reach at a state or national level. 
Uh, simple things are nowadays Wildlife Institute of India is taking on master students uh, to do their dissertation with them. So they can apply to that program in different capacities, either within the conservation of different uh, wildlife programs or with the wildlife forensic cell. Uh, that's one way they can do the dissertation directly with them because then they'll be working with really good conservation scientists and they can apply that much better. The other way they can do it is pick topics where there are where there is lack of data. So, for example, uh, understanding a particular the use of a particular uh, poison in the death of certain wild animal found endemically in say Karnataka. That's one way to go about it. Uh, they could even do an internship with the Karnataka Forest Department and then understand if there is particular data lacuna in an area, how can they then develop a technique that could be used or a data set that could be used to address uh, that situation. There are several okay. ways. Okay, so actually I belong to a part of Western Hacks. Okay. So there are some my students are working over there and so in, in mushroom research. Okay. And they have their friends who work in the zoology and wildlife department too. Mm -hmm. So so anything they can do a bit uh, unique uh, in Western Hacks. I will, what I will do is, sir, if you can write me an email, I will put you in touch with my colleague who works in the Western Ghats. He works in Sayatris. He's working yeah. on uh, large carnivore monitoring. So mm -hmm. maybe they can reach out to him and see if they can do internships with him and then develop dissertation programs accordingly. Okay, thanks. Thanks for suggestion. All right, no problem. Any other questions? What, okay, Pavitra has sent me a question. What opportunity lovely has for students to work upon? I'm a graduate from forensics. I'm at Inoida and currently pursuing masters in criminology and criminal science. Uh, Pavitra, when you're done with your um, you're doing your master's, right? When you're done with your master's, send me your CV. Okay, I can see Pavitra on screen, but she's silent. So, Pavitra, when you're done with your master's, send me your CV. We'll we'll talk then. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Hello, ma'am. I'm Supriya yes. here. Yes, Supriya. I wanted to ask which branch of uh, field can people apply for this, uh, I mean, wildlife uh, crime and for forensics? Um, so what I always recommend is that you study a basic science, uh, like, for example, Pavitra is doing, she's done a graduate in forensics and she's studying a master's in criminology. That's a good route to take to work in any crime space is to have a background in a basic science so you understand the science really well and know how to apply it in a criminal investigation setting, right? Uh, the other way is if you have the resources and can travel internationally, now there's some very good programs internationally, masters in wildlife, uh, crime, wildlife, forensics, for example, the University of Florida and the University of Western, uh, University of Washington have some really good programs. So you can check those out if you can. Uh, several ways to get in, but I always recommend studying a basic sciences in your bachelor's and then in a master's you do a slightly more specialized science depending on where your interest lies. Okay, thank you ma'am. So I wanted to ask if someone is doing their MSc from wildlife conservation and management, can they also be a part of this thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. I have colleagues who, who have not studied crime per se who are conservationists by training, but are doing fantastic work in uh, wildlife crime investigation, training work and other things. Okay, so how can one apply for it? Can you you just... have to first apply, you should first get some experience, finish your graduation. What are you studying right now, Supriya? Currently, I'm doing my MSc in, in wildlife conservation and management. From where? From Bhavan's College, Mumbai University. Okay. okay. So once you're done, you should ideally start working. Look for internship opportunities on projects. So if you sign up, there's a, a newsletter called Meet Yeti. This is for all of you. I'll just put the name in the chat. Uh, one second. It's called Meet Yeti. You can sign up to it and they regularly post internship opportunities with different wildlife organizations. Uh, so I always recommend that don't jump into a job immediately. Do a few internships. Get an understanding of what all you, skills you may need further and then keep a lookout for job postings with different NGOs. And then the world is your oyster. You have to work your way up. NGOs don't work the same way that uh, corporates do where there are postings and then you join and then you move up the ladder. It's a lot of hard work and commitment of time and energy. So it will take time. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? Uh, Sneha, Grace, how are we running on time? 
it's already 8:20 if you'd like to wrap up i'm fine i'm also okay to keep it open another 10 minutes for questions grace you're muted if you're speaking ma'am i think uh, all the questions are answered there's okay. no other questions okay uh, there's one question from tamanna that has come i'm sorry i missed uh, msc zoology student can do diploma in crime and forensics for doing yes absolutely in fact tamanna you don't need to do a diploma in crime and forensics but if you would like to add on to your cv and add on to your education always more education is always better uh, even with your msc zoology you you'd be more than qualified to work on wildlife uh, crime and wildlife general wildlife conservation projects hello ma'am Hi Tamanna. Hope I've answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, right now uh, I have done the fifteen days in uh, like fifteen days only to learn the course, basic only to learn the course. Now, right now I'm thinking about to apply a one year course in the BNSS course, proper ornithology one year course. Okay. So, uh, is it helpful, ma'am? Like. The PNHS ornithology program is great for general knowledge, but it's not definitely necessarily going to help you in your career. So whenever you pick a course, think about what it's helping you with. The BNHS program is great for general knowledge, and of course you could use that information in in your course of work at some point. But it's not going to advance your career greatly. So instead, maybe choose a more professional program if you are interested in crime. Look at a criminology. a post graduate degree or a diploma or something like that that's more focused on something you want to do yeah oh uh, ma'am i want to ask a, a question like when i completed my msc geology with specialization entomology okay. and in entomology i re, i specially give a paper special paper of forensic entomology Fantastic. so we can use that knowledge of forensic yes. entomology in the wildlife yes absolutely it's forensic huge science important. huge importance in a lot of wildlife crime cases especially in india where we have so much infestation carcasses are not found for days on end so any information you can provide especially in timeline understanding poisoning timeline of poisoning time of death if there are any special substances to consider any special infestations to look at all useful but for that you need to have time and patience to work ye nahi ki aapne degree pa li to kal ko aapke job aise मूवी में दिखाते ना थाली लगा के आरती आ जाओ बेटा हमारे साथ काम कर लो वाइल्ड लाइफ में दैट डजंट वर्क ओके ठिसाना पड़ता है अपने आप को बहुत ज्यादा यू विल हैव मेनी इयर्स ऑफ डिसअपॉइंटमेंट देन यू विल गेट समवेयर सो बी प्रिपेयर्ड फॉर हुएवर इज एनविजनिंग दिस वेरी ड्रामेटिक एंड ड्रीमी करियर इन वाइल्ड लाइफ आई विल टेल यू नाउ ओनली यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू हैव इट ओके इट्स अ लॉट ऑफ हार्ड वर्क इट्स अ लॉट ऑफ डिसअपॉइंटमेंट इट्स अ लॉट ऑफ बैटलिंग विद योर बिलीव्स इट्स अ लॉट ऑफ हार्ड वर्क मच ऑफ व्हिच कैन टेक यू नोवेयर because the system is not designed like the corporate system where you're helping a company achieve profits at the end of the day okay kisi ngo ko profit nahi hone wala hai aapke kaam se so you have to be really passionate about your work and and understand ki kam pay mein zyada kaam karna hoga but that's something i'm committed to if you're okay with that then jump in knowing that to leave it okay yeah? thank you ma'am all right any other questions Yeah, hi Sanita. Can yes, I just interrupt in between? Sure. <laughs> I'm sure. so sorry. Actually, the thing is, when you were talking about the internship, I was really fascinated with that because I remember you talked about the hard work. Mm. Um, that reminded me of the dissertation research that I did back uh, three years back, actually in 2018, mm. uh, while I was in university. Mm -hmm. But um, I just got <laughs> got married, and you know, scenarios changed. I never got that opportunity of uh, hopping yeah. into the job market. Yeah. But uh, even before hopping into the job market, I do feel that uh, an internship experience can play a very vital role in terms of uh, shaping or giving you a proper structure of being a researcher and investigator, or to you know propagate into the issue much more better. Yeah. so um what do you think i mean um i also did my masters in uh, zoology my special paper was fishery the reason why i had that a special interest in fish and dolphins right. as i uh, shared so um i would like to know that uh, according to you what do you think in terms of fisheries what are the prospects of uh, research oh, and the internship is, the scope is huge because now not only is wildlife uh, terrestrial uh, taking a lot of importance marine wildlife fisheries is becoming a one of the huge concerns especially with the un sdgs coming into play looking at sustainable fisheries is the yes. next big thing 
so there's tremendous scope for it all is just that finding the right organization so if i may uh, take the liberty there is a ngo by the name yeah. of dakshin that you should check out if you don't already know them they okay. do some fantastic work in the south of india on fisheries work uh yeah. and on uh, terrest on the marine and terrestrial ecosystem interplay on sustainable fisheries uh yes. you should work, look at them and try and see if you can do some work with them they're really good uh, as a starting point absolutely i i have uh, heard about and i have even uh, researched about the sustainable aquaculture practices that have been brought in india uh, right from certain organizations like um, norad and you know uh, the the different organizations from norway because they have already achieved a very good benchmark in terms of establishing a sustainable aquaculture practice yeah yeah um, the thing is yeah. after my uh, masters i got my research uh, recognized at a world aquaculture society and a mm -hmm. european aquaculture society so mm -hmm. i have few conference publications as well um mm -hmm. i i was working upon the fishery extension topic the community people who were associated with the fish value chain back in my city okay. so i tried to raise the situation issue of uh, how the situation was and you know the illiteracy and the social deterioration that was going on in the place right. Right. Uh, but um, somehow that point of time but now i actually feel that um, i need to start something with an internship because i don't want to hop up into a job market mm -hmm. so um, i just need your <laughs> suggestions regarding the internships um, the do. other internship you could look at i don't know if they would be open right away but every ministry now opens internships for people to participate in policy internships it's a new program that the government of india runs i have met a couple of young students who work with the government of maharashtra uh with different qualifications so and you can definitely look at either your state or the central ministry on fisheries see okay. if they have any internship opportunities or even posting them at a slightly junior level to start with to understand if there's any way you can work with them even if it's a communications okay. program even if it's just a fisheries project uh i mean fisheries is a big thing now it's the next big thing oh, yeah. after uh, wildlife so definitely lots of work coming up and also uh, because... the unep program in india they may have something in fisheries that you may want to explore Oh, absolutely the yeah, united nations that. environment program in india uh, you okay. may want to see if they have anything in fisheries that they're looking at yeah sure thank you so much yeah. for the suggestion i'll definitely look into it uh, it was really nice talking to you have nice a very nice day to all of you bye all right great guys i think it's sunday evening 8:30 baj gaye people want to go and party so i'm not going to keep more i would definitely want to go and now party after having done this session okay uh so uh, have a great evening uh, my contact details are available with the nature's eye people my email id i've shared with all of you if you have any questions please feel free to reach out uh, at any time working hours respectfully please uh, and uh, lovely thank you abhishek for your lovely message though i didn't get to see most of your beautiful faces i hope that this session has at least opened up your minds and uh, we'll interact more when we have the workshop so i see, hope to see many of you in the workshop if not all of you uh, there as well yeah uh, and i think right. yes grace all right with this we come to an end of this webinar thank you ma'am for an insightful and wonderful session i'm sure your experience is going to help most of us thank i especially you. want to thank you for your passion and all the depth and applications you got into with the topics and for making this webinar and its approach so simple to us uh, we would also like to inform our participants that if you want to learn more about wildlife crime and forensics do join our two day workshop on the same which will be conducted on the 23rd and 24th of june the original fee is rupees 485 and the discount that we are offering is rupees 385 but we have an exclusive offer for all of you who have joined today and waited till the end if you register now or within 10 am tomorrow that is the 6th of june you get to participate in our two day workshop for rupees 350 we also have a special discount for people who want to join in groups of four so that you can get an grouping offer of rupees 330 each so hurry up hope to see you to see you all in the main event and if any of you are interested please join our whatsapp group and let us know we will proceed accordingly thank you thank you everyone once again i'll see you soon take care bye bye thank you ma'am thank you